morning, Grace. How are we doing? Well, it's good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. Hey, uh, can we take a moment and thank the uh, many volunteers and staff who spent countless hours putting together this incredible Christmas decoration? They did such a great job. We were going to dress uh, Pastor Rick Garrett as Mr. Tumless and, uh, from the Chronicles of Narnia and put him in there somewhere, but we decided not to. So uh, let, me just, uh, let, me just, let me just say a couple of things real quick here. Uh, first of all, uh, Sweater Vest Mike is back, which I'm very excited about, right? So if you're new to Grace, like within the last year, you have no idea what we're talking about right now. Uh, every December, I get to wear sweater vests because I would wear them 365 days a year if I could. But my wife's like, no, you can't do that. But in December, we've made a compromise. And so I wear them all the time in December. So you'll see them for the next five weeks. And, uh, and then they just disappear magically as if they didn't exist. But I went looking for them the other day in the store at the mall, and I couldn't find any. And Kelly's like, that's because they're out of fashion. Like, that's, you don't wear them anymore. No, don't put them on. To which randomly, my son just echoes out, I can't wait to get old and get a dad bod like you too, dad. And I'm just like, that's not a thing to hope for. It's not a thing to hope for. But I'm glad I could be your model. So uh, anyway, here we are. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. We are finishing the book of Hebrews today. And uh, really been excited about this. The series has been an awesome series. I've loved going through Hebrews. Hebrews is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, let me tell you, before we jump in where we are right now, what we did last week. So last week, uh, we talked about the idea of inheritance. And what we said was, inheritance can be a blessing or inheritance can be a curse, right? So some of us grew up in this really, really amazing family. We had, this, we had this family where dad and mom were pouring into us. We never really knew a day where we weren't loved, we weren't supported. We knew that they were on our team. And as a result, all those things that we grew up with were brought into who we are today. In other words, that's the inheritance. All the legacy that we have has been given to us because we had solid parents. We had a solid foundation. We had people around us, teachers, friends, friend groups, all kinds of stuff just were super helpful for us to grow, both spiritually, emotionally, uh, and as a result of that, we are different people. And now, today, we're building on the advancements of those things that God has poured into us through our parents and through the significant others in our life. But then we said also that there's a whole other group of people in the room who had a broken inheritance. In other words, you didn't have that experience with a good mom, a good dad, good background, good relationships. None of that kind of stuff was what you grew up with. And we said that the bad inheritance can actually be something that is transmitted down through generations. So, so we, have, we know some people today who are super angry people. Why are they angry? Because my dad was angry. And that's just kind of an excuse that they use, right? It's a reason. Like, they just like, I'm angry because my dad was angry. My mom was angry. We related to each other in an angry way. And you can't choose the family you're born into because I tried to change it and they wouldn't let me. And, uh, but, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, we have choices. And this is what we said. You can't just become your broken inheritance because we don't want to pass the sins of the parents down to the next generation. We want to build. We want to be better. We want to grow spiritually. We want to grow emotionally. We want to grow as a family. So what many of us do is we begin to break those chains, right? I just had a conversation with somebody backstage. One of the staff members brought their father back and introduced me to him. And he was basically saying, I grew up like you did, Mike. Grew up in that kind of like super abusive family situation. And I'm like, you could never tell by your daughter. Like, your daughter is amazing. You could never tell. He's like, because I made different choices. And we just, we, we made different choices. And now we have a different inheritance. The rotten, terrible, uh, dysfunctional inheritance, uh, heritage and inheritance that you received from the past, you don't have to continue that on into the future. You have choices. And this is what I said. God is in the process, and this is what God does right now. God is in the process of rewriting the very history of mankind. When we were given absolute freedom and totality, we were given, Adam and Eve were not created to live forever. Adam and Eve, as long as they loved God and listened to God and obeyed him and lived in the happiness and the joy of a relationship with him, they would live forever. But they made choices out of their own free will to basically make those choices that would inevitably lead a bad inheritance to all of us, right? And as a result of that, Jesus comes into the world many, many, many generations later. Jesus comes into the world. And when Jesus comes into the world, the scripture calls him the second Adam. Why? Because the first Adam, us, left to only to ourself, basically said, hey, we're going to make our choices, and our choices are going to lead to an inheritance of brokenness. And that's what Adam and Eve give, gave to every single one of us. Now watch this. When Jesus comes, he's the perfect God-man. And as a result, he lives perfectly sinless life. So this new Adam is totally different than the old Adam. This new Adam is exactly what God wants him to be, exactly like God. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. 
And so now what that means is that God is now in the process of rewriting history. His job now is constantly renewing things, constantly restoring things, because our job is now to make the choices that we're going to make so that we can become like him, so that we can become more and more like God. As we do that, we experience more joy, we receive more fullness, we have better relationships, we have better connectivity, because we are dialed in and ready. Now, Today, we're going to end on a really, really high note, and that is this. We're going to talk about endurance, because one of the challenges in our spiritual life is that we still live in the broken world of Adam. We still live in a world where you're going to have trouble. Jesus, in fact, just said that. In this world, you will have trouble. And what he was saying, basically, is that this is not a religious question. This is a human question. So if you're in the room today, and you're just kind of fi- trying to figure out Christianity, you're trying to figure out, like what, like, what do I believe about God? What do I believe about Jesus? You need to know that suffering is a universal human experience because of the fall. And because of that, we all have to figure out whether or not, here's, here's the thing, we have to figure out whether or not the suffering that all of us goes through is actually going to be redeemed, or is it not going to be redeemed? Because for some people, the suffering that we go through over and over and over again, the hardships that we go through, that we just live over and over and over again, we'll talk about that in a little while, but that suffering is either going to be redeemed and, and, and changed for the good, or we're just destined to live it over and over and over again. And the ultimate tragedy, the ultimate tragedy is that there are some who will commit themselves to that brokenness for all of eternity, for all of eternity. They'll be separated from God, and as a result of that, they'll just live the same old brokenness over and over, same fears, same worries, same anxieties, all of that. But God's posture towards us is that he desires us to be holy like he is holy. And the word holy simply means to be like our Father. And so let's read a little bit right now. Uh, We're going to talk about endurance, and uh, let's look at it from uh, Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read a little while, and then we'll dive right back into the text. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, my daughter, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves." and he chastises every son that he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? All right, well, let's dive into this because this is a super important part of of the passage. Go back to verse one. It starts off with this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Now, the word cloud in the original language in the first century, it was something used in the Bible, but it was also used in extra biblical literature. And what it basically meant was a large group of people gathered together watching, right? So when the author says there's a cloud of witnesses, right? And we see this in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about this cloud as well. This cloud of witnesses, these people up in heaven that are actually watching what's taking place. They're watching God redeem the world. They're involved in watching us specifically. Actually, in Ephesians chapter 3, it talks about the fact that also angels watch over us and watch us as well, both good and bad. And so there is never a time in your life where the church is absent from you. You may not see it all the time, but the church is around you all the time. Here's what we know and what we don't know about the cloud of witnesses. Some of those people are named in Hebrews chapter 11, and they're, they're big, giant, you know, uh, uh, followers of God. But the question is that what we don't really know at this point, we don't really know if your grandma's watching. We don't know if when she dies, she's up in heaven now just kind of peeling out and watching you right now, right? Because here's something that some people have pushed back about this in this idea. This idea that once we get to heaven, right? And remember, let's just talk about this for a second. Heaven is not a permanent destination point for us. Like you're not going to live in heaven forever. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21 that, the, that, that, that God will bring down a new heaven 
and a new earth. And this new earth that we're going to live on, it's going to be like this, and we're going to have physical bodies. We're going to do the whole thing, but it's just going to be a place where heaven and earth are mutually together. We'll be able to go back and forth as we wish, right? So right now, they're separated because of sin. Now, this is an this is incredible thing, right? So here's what we don't know. We don't know if your grandma's watching you. We don't know what's happening there. But what we do know is that there are people watching at all time. And this is what he says. Therefore, since this, since this is true, that you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin. All right? So he says, look, because the people who are watching, I mean, I don't know, like just imagine your grandma's watching you all the time. Just, you know, that might be helpful for you, right? So, so like if you're like, oh, grandma, mm. All right, so therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. To lay aside something means to push it to the side, right? To say, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Like, I'm just going to get rid of this. That means, that's what it means to lay aside, right? So I'm going to lay aside every weight and sin. Now, some people, when they read that in their Bibles, they think that's the same thing, just like a synonyms for each other. They're not. They're different things. So let's talk about sin. We know that this, we're supposed to lay aside sin. If you've been in the church for a little while, you understand you're supposed to lay aside your sin. It's like, okay, okay cool, 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 check got that. Like, I know I'm supposed to put sin to the side, all right? However, it says here that we're supposed to also lay uh, aside every weight. Every weight does not refer to sins. Every weight refers to things that end up weighing you down, things that are not good for your spiritual life. They may not be, they may not be sins, but when you do them, you feel more depressed. When you do them, you feel more anxious. When you do them, you feel, for more, you feel more fearful. When you do them, you don't feel closer to Jesus. You feel like you want to run from Jesus. When you do them, they're not necessarily sins, but when you do these things, there are certain things in your life that you're doing that eventually, ultimately leads you to feeling worse about yourself and your relationship with God. Now, they objectively may not be sinful things, but they're not leading you to good places with God, right? And so he says, you're supposed to lay these things to the side. We're supposed to push these away. Can I give an example of one of those things? Like just a couple of them, actually. So I just want to put this in front of you because I'm trying to fight for your happiness right now. Social media. Can we just talk about that for a second? Social scientists, as, 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 well, as, as well as writers, you know, all over the world right now are writing about the deleterious effects, the terrible effects of social media on the life of the average American, right? Here's the reason why, right? Nobody gets on there and, and puts up terrible, ugly pictures of themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Like, you know, you don't get up there and you're like, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't happen. Like, that's not going to, like, you're not, but so, so, so here's what you do. You put the beautiful, amazing, incredible picture up there of you. And for some reason, everyone's always in Spain. <laughs> I don't know how these people have the money to do all that, right? But they're just always somewhere. Where are you? We're skiing in the Alps, you know? I'm just like, cool. Like, I'm at Park Avenue, you know? But, 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 but that's what happens. We take our life and we compare it to really the plastic persona of each and every one of these people. And we feel bad about ourselves. Now, sometimes we don't even do that on a conscious level, but we look at them and go, I wish I could do that. Like, I wish I could do that. And so our job is to lay aside those things that weigh us down and destroy our relationship with others, make us feel terrible about ourselves, and hinder our relationship with God, right? And so clear, clearly we're supposed to push away sinful things because that, that's going to have the same kind of effect on us ultimately, but we have to lay aside every weight and sin, which clings so closely. If you have your NIV Bible with you right now, right? Uh, we, do, we use the ESV Bible, but, you know, if you have your NIV Bible, it doesn't say clings so closely. It says easily entangles you. And so the image behind it is that there's something that when you get stressed and worried and when you get anxious about your life, when you feel like life is not unfolding the way that you want it to, there's a certain sin that easily entangles you. The word entangles here in the, in the original language is one of hunting, where you're walking through, the, where you're walking through the, um, the forest and you hit a bear trap and it closes on you. It snaps shut on you. It's entrapped you. You can't open it. You can't peel it back. It's going to take great exertion and you may not be able to do it. But here's what he's saying. That there's something in your life when you get stressed, you run to it. You run to the computer to look at things you shouldn't look at. You run to the shopping center to buy a bunch of stuff that really isn't going to make you feel good in the long run, but makes you feel good in the moment. Some of it's not outside stuff, it's inside stuff. You run to fear and you go, oh, I just, I can't do it. I'm not, I'm not going to be okay. And you spend time just cycling through these things over and over and over and over again. This is the sin that easily entangles us. And he says, you've got to put this aside because if you don't put it aside, you're never, ever going to endure. 
I love this. Lay aside every weight and sin which clings, which captures us. And it says, run with endurance. I love that phrase, run with endurance. Like it's not casual, okay? Can I just say that? Like when you're going to run with endurance, you're going to, I mean, this is the race. You are getting in the posture of putting yourself in the place of being able to run and endure. But you can't run and endure. Watch this. You cannot run an endurance race until you have endured some stuff. It doesn't matter how much you want to run a marathon if you're just a Netflix person all the time and you're like, one day I'm passionate about waking up and I'm going to run a marathon. You know, you're like, I'm going to do it. And you tell 1,200 people, I'm running a marathon. It's going to be amazing. You should show up. You should cheer me on. It's going to be great. I'm passionate about it. I believe in it 100%. You're going to die. <laughs> like that's, that's just not, that's, you can't do it. Why? Because I've not done the endurance, right? Like I'm, I, I don't run, I had to run to the end of the street and then I had to run to the, to the next street and then I had to run... You know that side split thing that you get? You need that in order to be able to endure to the end. Endurance requires us to endure. But he says this. He's like, he, he, listen to what he says. He says, he says um, avoid the sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance. So, so the posture of an endurance athlete is going to be one who puts himself in the position of being able to do the race, right? You have to endure things in order to develop endurance. But the posture that's really casual, you know, he's saying your spiritual life, you can't have your posture towards God like this. How's your relationship with God? And, you know, it's good. Because no one runs like this, you know? That's not how, that's not how that works, right? You have to put yourself in the right, you have to put yourself in the right posture to be able to endure things. For many of us, just this physical analogy is super helpful for us spiritually because what we recognize is that when hard things come our way, we try to avoid them instead of enduring in them. Because on the other side of endurance, of in, the other side of enduring is endurance. That makes you stronger. It makes you more hope-filled. It makes you be able to look a little bit more like Jesus. So run with endurance. Don't have a casual relationship with God because that relationship will not enable you to endure, which means you will not have endurance in your life. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Verse two, this is what it says. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So how do we do this? We look to Jesus. Can I just tell you like one of the very, very basic ways, like one of the things that God has given me, you could ask my wife about this, you can ask people who know me really well about this, but one thing that God has given me, like an ability, I have the ability to change. I don't know why, God just gave me, and I'll tell you some of why I think it is, but, but I have the ability to change. Like when we first got married, my wife was like, my, my wife was like, hey, um, do you, what are we gonna do for Christmas? I'm like, you know, I don't really like Christmas because here's, here's the thing, like I grew up, and my parents were kind of, they were married sometimes and divorced and married and divorced. And, 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 and sometimes I'd have to go spend Christmas with my dad's girlfriend of the du jour, you know, of the week. And I'm like, this is, I knew that I knew that Christmas was supposed to be family and I'm hanging out with this chick and my dad, you know, that wasn't family. And so for me, I was just like, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. So I got married. We didn't talk about this beforehand because I was trying to get her. And, uh, and, and, so, and, so, and so what happened was like, I, we got married and she's like, what are we going to do for Christmas? I'm like, I don't really like Christmas. And she was like, huh? <laughs> she goes, she goes, hey, um, that's just not acceptable. I was, and she goes, you're going to be married to me. We're stuck together now. Like, we're, like you're going to love Christmas one day. And I absolutely love Christmas. I mean, I'm like known around here as the Christmas guy for this season. Like, I love Christmas. Why? Because I loved her. And I would endure anything to be able to get to the place where I needed to be in order for me to love her well. I want you to get that for a second. So, so, so what do we have to do? Like, what do we do? In order to be able to change, you have to change what you're looking at. In order to change, you have to change what you're telling yourself. So this is why verse 2 starts with, it starts with, some verses actually say, fix your eyes on Jesus. It says, looking to Jesus. 
So if you want to get rid of some kind of addiction in your life, if you want to get rid of, you know, if you want to stop smoking or vaping is the cool thing today, right? Uh, which is killing everybody. So, uh, so that's cool. Uh, but, but, you know, vaping or cigarettes, or you want to stop drinking or sleeping around or doing whatever it is, like whatever the thing is, like you're looking at it, you're going, I know this is not what God wants from me. It's just hard to stop looking at stuff on the internet to do whatever because the desire seems so big. Here's the reason why. Because you're so focused on the thing itself, you can't get beyond the thing itself. So can we do a weird thought experiment for a second right now? Just, just a little thought experiment. It's not new agey. It's all right. Be all right. All right. So, so just listen. Like, so here it is. Here it is. I'm going to ask you for the next two minutes not to think about a pyramid, okay? Just like, like don't think about a pyramid for the next two. Like, like you're already laughing. Why? Because you're like, okay, I'm not going to think about a pyramid. Oh! Oh! You know, just like... Because every time you try to hold on, like every time you try to get rid of the pyramid in your head, you got to hold on to it to get rid of it. What does that mean? Like, what are you trying to say? Here's what I'm trying to say. If your whole life is revolving around trying to stop smoking cigarettes, stop drinking, stop cheating, stop doing, watching some kind of something on the internet that you should be watching, then your entire life becomes that. And instead of being this, it shrinks down to something really small. What is my life? My life is trying to stop smoking. But instead, the Bible, in its infinite wisdom, understood that that was never, ever going to work. And so what do we do? We fix our eyes on Jesus. I look to Jesus. And what does that do? What I behold is what I become. And so if you were to take, just if you look at the walls right now, look at both sides of the walls, right? You've got these beams of light, and then it goes dark at the top. They just kind of bend around, right? If you take a light and you diffuse that light. It just goes broadly everywhere. But it doesn't really have a major impact other than illuminating our eyes. But if you take a, if you take a light and you narrow the beam 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 till it is the most fine beam, you fix that beam on an object and it will cut through steel because it's a laser. That's the same thing with our focus. When our focus is focused on Jesus so much, here's what ends up happening. This is just what I've seen over and over again in my own life and in the life of others. It's not about trying to stop do the, doing these things. It's about fixing our eyes on Jesus so much that all these other distractions around me are not going to turn my attention. My eye is laser focused on Jesus. And so because it's laser focused on Jesus, all of a sudden one day I wake up and I'm like, I don't really want to smoke anymore. That's killing me, and, I, and Jesus loves me, and I should care about myself. And I, I don't, I don't want to be with other people. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. I'm not going to do whatever it is. I'm not going to steal from my company. I'm just whatever. I'm, whatever it is, I'm, I'm going to let that go. Why? Because I love Him. Because I'm so focused on Him. Because He's my heart. He's my goal. We're one. And so these things are disempowered. The way that you get rid of something in your life is to love something else better. And that's what verse 2 means. It means we fix our eyes on Jesus himself. And when Jesus is our object, we become like him. So here's what it says. Looking to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith. I love that. Number one, it says this. I didn't start this thing. God started it with me. We always talk about receiving Christ. But at the end of the day, we receive Christ because he first received us. And when he received us, all of a sudden things began to change inside of us. And notice right when it says the perfecter of our faith. Here's what I want you to understand. That concept of perfect is, a perfect is an idea that really twists us up sometimes. It can definitely be distorted. So for some of us, we walk around going, I'm not perfect, I'm never going to be perfect, and therefore I should not even try. See, what he says here is Jesus is the one that starts our relationship, and he's the one that is perfecting that relationship. So that means that you and I are cooperating with Jesus our entire life. It's not like I'm trying to stop doing these things or avoid these things. It's that God is pulling me in the direction of him. Jesus is walking with me, and he's cutting these things off of my life. So that at the end, I look more like him than I did with a broken inheritance that was handed to me. This is why some people become generation breakers in their life, like the guy I talked with backstage. Some people just go, I'm not going to continue that anymore. I'm not going to pass that down from generation to generation. I'm going to look to Jesus who is perfecting me. And the concept of being perfected, you're never going to be perfect in this life. But here's what you will be. You'll look a little bit more like Jesus. You'll look a little bit more like Jesus. You'll look a little bit more like Jesus. You'll have a little bit of more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Every two years, you can go back and go, I love a little bit better. I'm a little bit more joyful. I have a little bit more peace. I'm more patient. 
And you can just continue down the list. And in 10 years, you'll be able to look back and go, I love a lot more than I did 10 years ago. I'm a lot more patient, a lot more peaceful, a lot more joyful. Why? Because he's perfecting me. And this is, this is beautiful. Look what it says. Looking to Jesus, who is the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How do you develop endurance? You develop endurance by enduring. You have to go through the hardship. You can't go around it. You can't sidestep it, and you can't short-circuit it. You have to go through that. Look at what it says here. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Did Jesus have joy in going to the cross? No. I mean, in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was a garden that Jesus was in with the disciples right before he was arrested by Roman guards and taken to the cross, he's praying to the Father, God, don't, I don't want to do this. Like, if it's, if it's, if it's at all possible, if, it, if there's a conceivable plan in your mind, God, where I could skip this, because even though Jesus was God, he was also fully human. He felt every lash. He felt the crown of thorns. He knew, he knew what was going to happen to him, and he was afraid And Jesus, he says, Father, if there's any way that you could just let this pass by me. But you know what? Not my will. Your will be done, Father. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross. But it was because the Father put a joy before him on the road to the cross. And what was that joy? This is the key to change total key to change. What was the joy? You. Jesus went to the cross and was willing to endure all the physical torture, the mental and spiritual separation from the Father and the Holy Spirit. He went through all of that because in his heart he knew that if he did not go to the cross, you could not go to heaven. And so the Father put a joy in front of him. He painted a picture in Jesus' heart and mind, of his resurrection, of the goodness that would be poured out on you. He knew in 1987, this kid that grew up never thinking about him, abused by his father, terrible legacy, terrible heritage, and terrible inheritance, would be utterly transformed in the blink of an eye. But it would not happen if Jesus didn't go to the cross. And so Jesus had the joy set before him, and he was willing to endure it all. It didn't mean that he had fun in the cross. It meant that he was going to be tortured, brutalized, and rejected by the very people that he came to save. And in that, Jesus knew that when he was raised from the dead on the third day, that he would have won victory for you. See, that's the key to change. You have to love something more than the thing that you love that you're trying to get rid of in your life. If you're going to endure, it means that you have to come to the realization that I actually do like drinking more than my family. That I like watching pornography more than I love God. That I like my fear more than I like hope. That I like like anger more than I love the people around me. And when you come to that realization, you can confess it, you can walk out of it, and you can fix your eyes on Jesus because it's the only hope. But there's this other side that, that, that we look at. Jesus is the hope. We fix our eyes on him. But the conclusion is the joy that's set before us. He endured the cross. Jesus didn't go there joyfully, happily, or skipping. He was beaten, the Bible says, and bruised for your iniquities, mine iniquities. That word iniquities means sins. For the, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame. Jesus was shamed being up on the cross. Here's the perfect sinless son of God between a thief and a murderer on the cross. It says he despised the shame. Jesus felt every little bit of the cross, and now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Father raised him in power and in dignity, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. This is the key to defeating all sin in our life. If our focus becomes our sin, our life will become our sin. If our focus becomes Jesus, our life will become Jesus. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said it this way, looking unto Jesus means life, light, guidance, encouragement, joy. Never cease to look on him who ever looks on you. Jesus is always watching out for you. 
He's always got his eye on you. Verse 3 says this, and I love this because this, this is a great example for us. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. This is Jesus. There were so many people who looked at Jesus and just said bad and terrible things about him. Let me just say this. If you're thinking about Christianity, I don't want to give you a, seri- a, a super easy believism. I want you to understand it's hard to be a Christian today. In 21st century America, it's hard to be a Christian. People will call you haters of these people, haters of those people. You don't love these people. You don't love those people. You, you're not nice. You're not this. You're not that. That's not the people that I hang out with. Those are not the Christians that I know. They're the stereotype of Christians that people don't know. But when they come across you and you are loving and joyful and peaceful and kind, I keep, by the way, I keep in my head, I keep mixing up fruits of the Spirit when I'm doing it with the Boy Scout. Loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, thrifty. Sorry. So, so, but those are good things too. So consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. What he's saying is, if Jesus went through these hard things, so will you. And don't grow weary. Don't worry about it. When people say that you are this way and this way as a Christian, say, no, 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 no. I'm who God tells me I am, not you. I am the person that God has created. But Jesus went through this hostility. At his own synagogue in Nazareth, they wanted to kill him. I've never come to church and had someone come up and go, I'm going to kill you now, right? It's just never happened. The religious leaders constantly tried to trap and embarrass Jesus. They lied about him saying that he was a drunkard and a glutton. They called him a friend of sinners and tax collectors. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples, one of the 12. He was mocked and beaten by people. His own people cried out right after after he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and people were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Just a few days later, they were screaming, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The writer of Hebrews looks at Christians in the first century, and he says, in your struggle against sin... You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What he's saying is this. You have a long ways to go. We live in a world today where we're not probably going to have to shed our blood. But we're going to have to be able to have thick skins of enduring things so that we can have endurance to get to the end when people say, you're like this. And we go, that's not us. Just spend some time with us. You'll know what we are. Like We are the people of Jesus. We're different than what you think we are. Like it's the stereotypes in your brains that are, that are all about Christians. You lump them all together, man. If we did that with any other category in the world, we'd have problems. I mean, if Bernie Madoff, who was a financial planner, was ripping people off for most of his life, we don't look at financial planners today and go, they're all rip-off artists. We don't look at people in business and go, because one guy's terrible, all business is terrible. That's foolish thinking in the world around us, and we have to be super patient with it. But you don't need to be worried. Because in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Verse 5 says this, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Everywhere where he says this sons, it also means daughters, okay? So we can put that in there. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? In other words, God's not some distant uh, king on 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 a throne. He is a father to us. When you call Jesus brother, you call him father. One of the reasons we lose hope is that we forget that God is our Father, that He superintends the world, that He oversees everything, that He loves us and has the power to orchestrate our life. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Now, let me just talk about the suffering that comes into our lives for a second. It's not all the discipline of the Lord. And I'm just going to be, I'm going to tell you this because I love you. I'm going to tell you this because I love you, but it's super important. This doesn't apply to everyone in the room, but it does apply to some of us in the room. I'm going to tell you this because I love you and I'm fighting for your happiness and I'm fighting for your joy. Some suffering that comes to us is not because God brought that suffering into our life. Some suffering that comes to us is because we made bad choices. Okay, now I want you to catch this for a second because this is good news. You can avoid those choices and avoid a lot of suffering in your life. We talked about it every once in a while. Like I had a guy come up to me the other day. He goes, he goes hey, man, I think, I think experience is the best teacher. And I'm like, that's insane. Like, I, I, I've never experienced cheating on my wife to know I would be killed by her if that happened. Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do that because I don't need that experience to tell me, hey, I've watched other people do that. That's dumb. I'm going to just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk around that trap right there, and I'm not going to jump into that. I'm, hey, guess what? You know what? Uh, I'm not going to steal from the church, and I'm not going to go to prison. That'd be awesome. Like, I'm going to avoid that, right? So, so, so I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, 
become super proud because, you know, hey, God opposes the proud. He puts them in ditches. I don't want that. Like, I want to avoid that kind of suffering. Some of us, here's what we do. We make a series of choices. We know our friends who do this, right? We, we know people who marry, and they marry the next person. They marry the, they marry the same person. There's just different name, different looks, but the same person on the inside. And we go, you know that's Joe, the guy that you just divorced, right? No, he loves me. And we just, we're incredulous to it. We think to ourselves, why would somebody do that? And here's the reason why. It's a pit. They don't see it, and they just fall right into it. The kind, of, the kind of suffering that God's talking about here, the kind of discipline he's talking about right here is not that kind. We can avoid that part of suffering, and we can actually, we can avoid a ton of hardship in our life. You can take a life that goes like this and turn it into a life that goes like this real easily. And you take the stuff that's in this book, and you put it in here, and you put it in here. And when we do that, all of a sudden now we have the wisdom, we have the discernment to avoid the pit. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. But the discipline of the Lord is a different kind of thing. He brings this into our life for the purpose of shaping us. He creates endurance in our life so that we may be able, he creates things that we have to endure so that we may create endurance. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary uh, when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. I told you guys, uh, I told you guys a couple months ago that I started working out with a personal trainer, right? A guy who goes to this church because he was tired of me talking about being unhealthy, right? And so he goes, hey, just come work out with me. And so I, you can't tell yet. But, uh, but, I, start, but like, I, I started working out with him and he's awesome. I was doing leg lifts the other day, right? Uh, and, and so just on this little machine doing leg lifts, you just kind of push it. All right. How many of you have done leg lifts before? Raise your hands. Okay. This is the most fit service out of all of them. Literally in the first service, right? You would think that this would be the one that's not so fit because you're here later. You're like, I don't know, I'm a Moses before and I'll go to church. Yeah, so, so but, but, but in the first service, there were like five people. I was like, get gym memberships, you guys. Like, man, you're gonna die at 40. Okay, so, so but, but, here, but here's the thing. So I, here I am, I'm doing these things, right? And here, this is, this is fascinating to me because, right, I'm always pulling out spiritual principles, right? So, so here I am doing these things, right? And he's like, and I'm coming to the end of myself. Like, I know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm done, man. It's burning, it's terrible, it's awful. And he goes, all right, 10 more. I was like, I was like, I can't do, I, like, that was, the, that was my last one. He goes, no. And I started to kind of get up from the machine, and he pushed me down into the machine. And I was like, I love this guy. Like, what? Because, because here's the reason why. Like, I was going to give up. Here's the thing. When you do 20 of these, they're completely worthless. It's the last five where you're burning, and it's terrible, and you're going to walk out like this that actually does something for you, right? It's the last part of it. And he's like, you got to get to that last part of it. I want you to fail on this so that you can become strong. Why? Because when you endure something that is resistance, it creates strength in you, in your body and in your spirit. And so Jesus disciplines us. But watch this. This is super important. It says this, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. This is a hardship for us. Here's the reason why. Because we look around the world today and we see people who are not followers of Jesus, not lovers of God, and they seem to prosper all the time. And so we ask the question, why do good things happen to bad people, God? Why do you let that happen? And here's the reason why we think that, because we're trained by karma, not Christianity. Karma teaches us that good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. Well, we know that good things can happen to bad people and bad things can happen to good people. But the reality here is, like one of the things that we, that we struggle with right here is the same thing that King David struggled with in the Old Testament. King David was a king over Israel. And he, he, made, he asked the question, he asked the question uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, he says, God, why do you prosper the wicked? And so he goes through this whole thing, complaining, complaining, complaining. And then he comes to the statement, middle of the psalm. And he says, and then I considered their end. Why do you prosper the wicked, God? And then I considered the end. And what he was saying was, oh, some people are going to do really, really well in this world, not follow you, not love you. But in the end, they're only going to receive themselves and all their brokenness forever and ever and ever. So when the Bible says this, I want you to think about it. When the Bible says God disciplines those he loves, it means that he allows hard things and even brings them into our lives sometimes to create resistance so that we'll be better endurers in the long run so that we'll look more like him at the end. We're going to look more like him, but, 
And here's, the, here's where it all gets kind of like lumpy out for us. And this is where we all kind of like, wow, that's, that's crazy to think about. If God disciplines those he loves, what that means is that some people who are not disciplined by the Lord, some people who just seem to get away with it over and over and over again, we look at their lives, we're like, how are you continuing to prosper? How are you continuing to go through those difficulties? It means God doesn't love them. And I know it's hard that you go, whoa, 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 where did we just go right there? If God disciplines those he loves, if those who are not disciplined, it means that that is God's judgment on them. And we don't think about that in our world today. We think about, man, I want blessing and good things to happen to me, but when things look good on the outside and someone is wicked, we go, I don't understand that. And that actually may just be the judgment of God. He's saying, I'm going to let you continue to go down your own path, and you're going to break your life into pieces. And hopefully, in that point, you'll turn because I've been here my whole life, sent my whole son to you. I'm waiting for you. But sometimes he lets people who don't love him and prosper and prosper and prosper and prosper and prosper until eventually, hopefully, they turn to him. So don't just think that when you're not laying aside the things that you need to lay aside, that God's just saying, I'm with you on that, man. You can continue in that sin. Sometimes he's just saying, continue to go down that road. And it's going to hurt you in the long run. But I'm here for you when you want to turn to me. Because he speaks to us as sons and daughters. So when when someone else's kid is out in public, right, and they're doing something wrong, I never jump into that. I hope you don't either. Like, that's a weird thing to do, right? But like, when someone else's kid, I might, you know, quietly judge them in my head, but I don't actually like jump in and say, hey man, your kid's out of control, right? Because that never goes well. But when my kid's out of control, I jump in. Why? Why? I'm a father. I love my kids in a way that I don't love your kids. <laughs> Sorry, that was terrible. Um, but I do. I love my kids, and so do you. And so we speak to them. Look at what verse 7 and 8 says. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. So when, you go, when God brings hard things into your life, he loves you with all of his heart. The heart behind it is what's important. Not the hard thing that you're going through. The heart behind it is not God coming down on you with condemnation. The heart is the heart of the Father who's forming you and shaping you and saying to you, I love you so much, I'm not willing to just let you continue down a road of destruction. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So he's saying that if you continue down a road where you're not disciplined, you might call yourself a child of mine, but you're not. You're an illegitimate child. And then he kind of ends it. I love this right here. Verse 9, it says this. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Some of us did that. Shall we not much more subject ourselves to the father of spirits and live? Right? In other words, God's honorable. Our, Our fathers are not always. Verse 10. For they discipline us. Our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time and it seemed best to them. As I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot more grace towards my dad. And it's not an excuse for the behavior that he had, but I've, I, I mean, I, we came to reconciliation at the end of our life, without a doubt. But one of the things I remember my dad telling me when, he was, when, when we were much younger, when I was much younger, is he had this um, old Baptist minister. His name was Uncle Dabney. And Uncle Dabney, my father went from, um, I don't even think it was a real uncle, but he was just called Uncle Dabney. And, and he, my father went from uh, foster house to foster house to foster house. When my coal miner dad, uh, grandfather died in the, in the coal mines of West Virginia, uh, which is really disconcerting that I'm from West Virginia. Uh, but when he died in the coal mines of West Virginia, um, what ended up happening is my grandmother on my father's side ended up just dropping him off at somebody's doorstep and then never saw her again. Back in those days in, that, in, that, in West Virginia, everybody was so poor you couldn't even afford to you know, feed your children. And so he went from state home to state home to state home. Well, one day he was with Uncle Dabney, and Uncle Dabney just used to beat him regularly. And so I started thinking that, well, I just take, he would take the belt and he'd just slap him in the face with it, slap him on the back, and just beat up, beat up his back. And uh, I just, you know, as I got older, I kind of looked at that, and certainly there's never, ever an excuse for doing anything like that. But I feel like there's a little bit of grace in my heart. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. They just did what they knew what to do, you know? And for some reason, he never grew out of that, never learned how to get rid of the old broken inheritance. You can. You can. I have. And so can you. There's no reason ever to say, I am this way because my parents were this way, or I am this way because someone gave me this from the past. You can absolutely break that generational sin in your life without a shadow of a doubt. 
For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good. Did you notice that? It's a shift. The he there is God. God disciplines us for our good. We always are okay. And here's how we end the whole thing. Verse 11, super honest. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Yet, but later, it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. That's a qualified statement, and it basically means this. You're going to go through hardship. All of us are going to go through hardship. You're going to go through difficulties. God allows us to endure things so that we develop endurance in our life. But here's the thing. You have to. You have to when God brings difficult things into your life. You have to be trained by it or you're doomed to repeat it again. So God tests us with this. And, and, and ultimately, I don't want to fall into the same pit over and over and over again. I want to live a new life. I want to live a new legacy. I want a new inheritance for my children. And because of that, I'm going to take every opportunity to be trained by everything that comes into my life so I can pass that test and not have to live it over and over and over again. And that is another way that we can live without suffering and endure to the end. Amen? Jesus, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you that you, Father, are a father who gives us a new inheritance and is writing a new story. Lord, we just can't do this on our own. I thank you for the wisdom that you've poured into my heart and into my mind, God, uh, from your scriptures. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you're not going to just let us walk down a path of self-destruction and self-deception. But instead, Father, you're going to intervene, and sometimes you do so, to create things in our life that help us to endure. Father, create that endurance inside of us. None of us want to pray, God, that you are, you are uh, disciplining us. Lord, we pray that you would be gentle with us, God, that we would learn not simply by experience after falling into every pit in our life, but we would learn by example, by the example of Jesus, by the example of your scriptures, by the example of wise people who have done better things than we've done in our life, God. May we attach ourselves to those people so that, so that we can break that generational curse. In Jesus' name, amen.